Namaste, Supravatam to everybody. This Vidyanidhi series has been happening from the beginning of this year, and a lot of you showed enormous interest in the concepts that we discussed here, and uh, a lot of enthusiasm was visible. So this specific Vidyanidhi that we are having today is not just from me, it's a collection of questions that a lot of you have asked. So I will attempt to give the details, some specific researches that have been done and um, some archaeological evidences wherever possible, uh, some um, specific news items that was presented, etc. So this entire Vidyanidhi today is basically to empower ourselves with some of the questions which has been bothering us for a very long time. So we will explore those questions. In fact, uh, there were a lot of questions. I will try to answer the number of questions which we could possibly accommodate in an hour. The remaining questions, as we progress in the future episodes as Nyananadi, we will try to answer it uh, now and then. So with that um, as the background, let's go on to today's questions. So Sujata Ji can ask the first question. Yes. Namaskar. The first question is, why should we sit and pray in our temples at home? God is present everywhere. Then why? There are so many Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, Puranas. Which one is important? There are so many gods, Krishna, Rama, Shiva, Vishnu. Whom should we pray to? Danyavadaha. Thank you so much. So I think uh, this is a question that uh, many have been having and um, uh, this answer I think is required for a lot of people. So let me just put it in a very, very simple manner. The first part of the question is, why should we go to temple? God is everywhere. Right? So to understand this, let's take a, a real life example. Sun's rays are everywhere. Heat energy we know is, uh, you know, there. We, without sun rays, we can't stay. But then uh, if we uh, want to dry our clothes, we just put it in the sun and it uh, gets dried. But if we use a lens and focus the sun's heat, that can even burn the fire, right? Similarly, uh, we have air everywhere. But when we are really feeling hot, we want to sit right under the fan or very close to the aircon. Why? Because it is focused energy that helps us in certain situations. And it is a general energy which is required in certain times. Similarly, the electric energy is available everywhere. But if we have to use it, it is channelized, right? So the uh, why do we lay so much of electric wire? So, so many circuits are there. All these are to channelize the energy. So God is, yes, omnipresent, omnipotent. Having said that, the focus energy is available in the temples. So when we go to the temple, we can absorb all the energy to our benefit. Now, the design of the temple is also done really scientifically, strategically, where the magnetic and electric wave distributions of the North and South Pole, the trust in it, you know, is utilized to the maximum. The main deity, which is uh, placed in the Moolasthanam, is at the core center. The maximum energy is the place where um, the Moola uh, Vigraha of the deity is decided to be placed. And the Earth's magnetic waves are maximum at that point of time. And typically, some copper plates and all are uh, kept below the deity with all the Vedic inscriptions, everything. And the entire surrounding vibrates with that kind of energy in the temple. So um, the magnetic waves, when we, you know, just uh, go do a productionum, gets absorbed in our body. And if you observed, the temples are covered on all three sides. It's because they don't want to dilute the energy. Otherwise, why should such a big temple have a small garbhagraha? So the idea is that, you know, that is the epicenter of all this energy. Now, to add to all this, Think of all what they have done inside the temple. The lamp generates the heat energy. 
the ringing of the bells all of us know the power of sound the chanting of uh, uh, veda mantras everything we've gone into detail in our previous vidyanidhis so all those vibrations add to it and today we speak of aroma therapy the concepts which soothes our mind and all that that is of course a very big part of the temple where the deity is adorned with all you know fragrant flowers and uh, it is a very different mindset the moment we go there and to top this all all of us learnt about the importance of the memory in water now this water memory is you know the deity is washed with that water where all this energy is absorbed in the water and that is distributed to all of us and uh, men are asked to be uh, you know um, not wearing any shirt or anything on top so that all this energy can be absorbed by them so what do women do they ask women to adorn themselves with all the metallic ornaments like gold and silver so that they can absorb all this energy so it is a combination of many different things that goes into visiting a temple so when we visit the temple we basically uh, charge ourselves you know like a cell phone gets uh, charged when we visit the temple we charge ourselves and uh, all these happen over a period of time you know our body slowly gradually absorbs all these things so we made it a practice go visit the temple every day start of the day get yourself all the energy that you need so this was told for our good so this is the first part of your question so why did um, our ancestors suggest that we go to the temple and not sit at home and pray of course we can sit at home and pray that is definitely an option but this is to help ourselves to focus better right now coming to Thank you. the second part of the question uh, does this answer the first part of your question sujata ji yes yes very nicely said thank you thank you so much now going to the second part of your question there are so many granthas you know um, when we go to other practices we know that you know there is just one book but when it comes to sanatana dharmam on one side we speak of vedas the other side of puranas itihasas bhagavad gita there are so many gods rama krishna shiva vishnu oh my god where do i start who do i worship are there so many gods why so many gods all these questions come up now the answer to this is very simple very straight forward we have only one god okay vedas very clearly say ekam sat ekam sat means there is one god okay vipava bahuda vadanti there are so many manifestations of that deity so ekam brahma brahma is ekam ekam sat that is the truth but there are so many manifestations we see god in everything we worship god the way we like so that is the kind of flexibility that is given by our ancestors to us and the term god is a very english word because when we go to our traditional language there are so many different words with which we address uh, people of uh, different levels for example the devas in the indra lokam are having their own respective duties but we use the same term god for brahmam and for devas which can lead to a lot of confusion so devas basically say that they are at a higher pedestal than us so this kind of uh, language uh, usage using same terms for multiple things have also caused a lot of uh, confusion in our mind so to answer your question there is a god people worship the god in the way which is easy for them to relate to for example if i like a baby i look at lord as krishna if i like the bhagavad gita as a upadesam i like him as krishna there are so many people who like certain aspects of lord shiva they worship him that way people like the way uh, lord rama ruled the country they worship ram so it is a lot of variety and option for you to identify with what is closest to your heart and start worshiping that god in fact there is a beautiful sloka which says ஆரோக்கியம் பாஸ்கராத் இச்சேத் தனம் இச்சேத் ஹுசாசனாத் மகேஸ்வராத் ஞானம் இச்சேத் மோட்சம் இச்சேத் ஜனார்தனா ஸோ டிபெண்டிங் ஆன் வாட் வி வாண்ட் வாட் வி லுக் ஃபார்வர்ட் டு வி கேன் அப்ரோச் த அப்ராப்ரியட் டைட்டி சன் காட் இஸ் சப்போஸ் டு பி யூனோ இன் சார்ஜ் ஆஃப் ஆல் யுவர் ஹெல்த் 
so you need good health do surya namaskaram you know <laughs> even today in yoga practice people say do surya namaskaram that's going to help you um gnanam ichet hutachana uh so for every specific thing you have a person who's in charge of it so whoever needs whatever goes to that person so moksha miche janardana if you need ultimate liberation you go to janardana so that is a holistic idea of having so many representatives and it is like an organization right where we have one ceo we have several departments each department has different heads and each department head will again have so many people reporting to them so this entire thing is like a organization structure para brahmam is there the devas do the respective duties and under each deva there is one huge department and everybody helps us to get where we want to get so that is this whole picture so we don't have to get confused about which deity what or anything it is all para brahmam and adi shankara beautifully has uh, phrased this in one shloka for us to remember where he says akashat patitam toyam yatha gachati sagaram sarvadeva namaskaram keshavam prati gachati so he says the rain drops right akashat patitam it will fall from the akasha ultimately the destination it has to go to the sea the water does not have any other option akashat patitam toyam yatha gachati sagaram he says sarvadeva namaskaram you bow to whichever deity you want finally what's going to happen keshavam prati gachati it is all going to go to keshava so you can uh, you know have that flexibility in your initial approach ultimately the end is the same so that was from adi shankara so sujata ji thank you very yeah. beautifully explained that is the second part of your question and um, just as an extension of this right i would uh, like to add that um, we have one book where um, we say that um, okay which is the soul's book that was also what sujata ji asked right vedas are there bhagavad gita is there purana sitihasa where do i start okay now the concept is that uh, if i ask a very simple question um which is the ultimate books in science do we have one book for science which is the one book in maths do we have a answer so when we go to standard text is there one book for astronomy is there one book for chemistry so when we look at you know which is one book usually we don't identify any subject which is one book we have variety of book because there is specialization of knowledge in each of this and end of it we call the entire thing as science or maths or everything in fact our shastras have integrated even the science maths astronomy and they have called this as vedas so vedas is the pramana for everything but it is not just one text when you need specialized knowledge you go to the appropriate text vedas have everything in the seed form it is the universal knowledge there is nothing which is not mentioned there because it's the universe itself so that is vedas but then you need how to practice it bringing theory to theater so how do you actually bring all this into practice that is explained in all your um, vedangas shiksha jyotisham uh, bringing the rituals into practice how do you follow it in your daily life i need examples then you go to how people actually used it live demonstration which is in the itihasas in ramayana mahabharata now um i need more stories which is really simple you know on how i need to apply it is there in your puranas so basically depending on what is required for us different books give us different information so it is on the seeker to go and choose the appropriate book we have to know at least the index so people say prayojana bedena prasthana bedaha depending on what you want it to be used you have everything so it is not one book we have a library and the library gives you the choice to choose from so you can choose what you need and specialize in that particular subject dhanyawad dhanyawad guru can I ask asha bhagini to unmute yeah yes. namaskara ha huh? my question to you two of them in fact ravina bhagini 
are these. I feel ancient texts and practices are male-centric. Why so? And the second question, if everything is God's play, then why do we have to practice rituals or no Vedas or the Upanishads? Okay, so Asha Bhagini has come out with two beautiful questions, typical of her kind of questions. So um, the first is, okay, I think, in fact, she's prefixed it with, I think everything is male centric, so I can't complain about the question as well. So it's her uh, thought. So let's just go on to what our scriptures actually say, you know. Um, so Asha Bhagini thinks that the ancient texts and practices are male centric. Why is it so? So before I answer why is it so, let me first look at is it so, <laughs> all right? So women are, uh, you know, adorned in our scriptures, not just for their beauty, but for their intellectual acumen as well. We'll be surprised that there are 27 Rigvedic poetess, you know, who've been uh, explained. Uh, there are the um, uh, rishis, who have been uh, mentioned in the Rigveda. And a lot of these seers debate with men and there are advices given by uh, women to men. So we will just go into a little bit of details into all this. So first thing, uh, anybody who is a Devi worshipper will know that uh, we have these three Shaktis, Icha Shakti, Jnana Shakti, Kriya Shakti. So the three strengths, which is the desire, knowledge, and action, which is the fundamental for anything that we do, are all attributed to the goddess, woman Shakti. Now, we could have called this as Icha Shiva, Kriya Shiva. Why did we not call it? It is all Shakti. So typically, our scriptures, wherever there is power or wisdom involved, it is attributed to the femininity. So that is a great thing. Any Devi temple you go, you will see that there is a depiction of Icha, Jnana, Kriya. So that gives the complete personality uh, as a representation. Now going on to the next one, there have been a lot of philosophical debates which are uh, mentioned in our scriptures. One such debate is by um, Yagnyavalka and Maitri which is a uh, essence of Upanishad. So to answer whether our uh, scriptures mention this, Upanishad itself, there is a mention of the Maitri questioning uh, Yagnya Valko on, you know, what will give me the ultimate wisdom and his answers and her repeated questions to get convinced is actually the entire compilation of that Upanishad. So that is uh, another very interesting um, scripture that we have on this. And um, not just in earlier times, even during uh, Adi Shankara's period, there is a very good recording on the uh, biography of uh, Sri Adi Shankara, which is about a lady called Ubaya Bharati. So the story runs like this. Um, Adi Shankara used to have the intellectual debates with people so that uh, whoever accepts his way of thinking would become an Advaitin. If Adi Shankara did not win, he said that I'm willing to take up your school of thought. So that was a kind of, you know, giving up even their own principles, which is bigger than their life, and, uh, you know, go when they are convinced intellectually. So Mandana Mishra was an extremely knowledgeable person, you know, who had so many followers to his credit. He followed practices which were very different from Adi Shankara's practices. So there was this heated debate. Now, both of them were like the absolute intellectuals of their times. Now, who is going to judge as to who is the winner? Because it needs a person of that caliber to decide. And you will be surprised that a lady named Ubaya Bharati was chosen. Because of her wisdom, she could say whether Adi Shankara was right or not, and Mandana Mishra was right or not. So just think about it. And that is mentioned in Sri Adi Shankara's biography. And um, he says uh, um, that, you know, Ubaya Bharati can be the judge because she's uh, such an intellectual and she won't be biased. Where is the question of bias here? Because she happened to be the wife of Mandana Mishra, who was a party in the debate. So typically people say that women are emotional, but both those myths are broken in this particular episode 
where uh, Sri Adi Shankara and Mandana Mishra accepted the intellectual maturity of Ubaya Bharati and Ubaya Bharati gave judgment in favor of Adi Shankara, which means she had to give up her husband, her family life and go behind Adi Shankara as a sainthood of her husband, right? So her entire life changed because of this episode and women lived to that kind of a mark in our tradition. So we know Kaikeyi went for battles and so many scriptures mention about the greatness of women like Ramayana, Manusmriti says, Yetra Naryas to Pujyante, Ramante Sarva Devataha. Wherever women are, you know, respected, worshipped, all the devas remain there. So these are some of the examples. And just to add to that, you know, there are many situations where women have advised men. You don't see this kind of thing in any other literature, another uh, except Sanatana Dharmam. Anusuya has advised Tara you know, has advised Vali saying that don't fight with Rama, you know, you will, uh, your life will be ending because Sugriva earlier was just by himself. Now Rama is supporting Sugriva. So if you fight Sugriva, your end is going to come. So Tara advises that. In fact, Tara also handles Lakshmana in a very different way. So all that is uh, mentioned. Sita argues with Rama, which is mentioned in Ramayana, saying that I will join you to the forest. How can you not take me there? And Draupati challenges Bhishma, Drona, and also the Pandavas in the uh, Kuru Sabha itself. Mandodari advises Ravana. So we know Ravana is a you know, um, very strong personality, but his wife advises him. So all these are there in our scriptures, which we should just get accustomed to. Most of the common things which we get to know is from a different perspective, because uh, these days men tend to speak so they tend to speak what is closer to their mind. So here I come. So we'll speak about what are the sites which are women uh, centric in our scriptures also. So to answer your question, it is not just male centric, even for the practices, the rituals. During the bachelor time, men are not allowed to perform any ritual which has fire in it. Agnikaryam na karaniyam is there. Similarly, after a person takes sannyas, where they are supposed to be even more pious, they are not eligible to perform any rites for the fire. So only during the Grihastha Ashramam, where he is with his wife, he is permitted to perform these rituals. So, so much is the importance given to women. So uh, just to make the entire thing light, I would say that, you know, people did whatever uh, their skill sets were. So women did all the things which were backstage where they had to do the preparation, they had to make everything ready, they had to, uh, you know, not leave any gaps in any of the rituals or the practices. But men were in the forefront where they recited whatever is required for the Agni. Even then women had to, you know, touch them to say that, you know, please go ahead with whatever you're doing. I give my permission for it. So I would rather say that women were the CPU, men were the monitors. So <laughs> that is to summarize why they are not visible in the front screen. Asha Bhagini. <laughs> Danya Vadaha. Bahu Samyak explanation. So thank you very much. Can we have Lakshmi Bhagini? Lakshmi? Please unmute yourself, Lakshmi. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Um, good morning, uh, Praveena Guru. Uh, as per today's uh, situation, I have a question. Uh, was there any of these kind of pandemic situations in uh, Puranas and Itihas we were uh, discussing? And uh, if it was there, how did they uh, come out of this situation? Hello? Yes, Lakshmi. Yes. Thank you. Okay. The, was it clear? Yes, Lakshmi Bhagini. So, um, was there pandemic situations earlier in um, uh, you know our times, and how did uh, people handle such situations? So, a question which is very relevant for uh, today's situation. So, um, we are speaking about a very very long history, right? So, whatever 
happens now, as I repeatedly say, would have happened at a very different uh, level, at a different uh, time earlier. So history typically repeats itself. So to answer your question, I have uh, two interesting um, news items which I uh, gathered. So let me just share that with you. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, just hold on for a second. I'm not sure why this is not appearing. Is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I have two uh, news items which I would like to share. So um, the UP Assembly Speaker, um, Pradeena Rayan Dikshit, has uh, mentioned this particular thing where he says that Atarva Veda has many solutions to the pandemics. So he says that, you know, uh, a lot of uh, research is uh, going on on that in so many other countries, but not in our country. So uh, that is something that uh, is here. And uh, there is another very interesting um, news item which I gathered, uh, which was in India today, where uh, the news item says 5,000 year old ancient scriptures had described something similar to coronavirus itself. Not something uh, close to it, but very similar to that. So um, the author speaks about uh, Kirmi, uh, the Slesha Kirmi, which is like, you know, very, very uh, uh, atomic, which can't be seen by the naked eye. Mahasukshma, it is mentioned. And uh, the Charaha Samhita explains how they settle in the respiratory system, the shape of it, which is round with spikes, etc. And once it settles in the respiratory system, how it creates cough, severe congestion, breathlessness, and sometimes might lead to death, so on and so forth. So a lot of explanation on the typical thing has been explained. Not just that, they have also given solutions to it, starting with isolate yourself. So that was the initial solution that was given to it. And it says, don't feed the kirmis. So don't feed the virus. Uh, because they will become more active. And they have told very clear details of what could feed the virus. So they have uh, clearly mentioned what are the specific food to be eaten, what are the specific food to be avoided. So you could just go and Google for this particular article where the author has explained everything very clearly. So they advise certain immune boost, uh, boosting herbs, especially for the respiratory areas. So a lot of information has been there and uh, people have uh, been utilizing it. So you could get in touch even with Dr. Uh, Nishant, who is an Ayurvedic practitioner who is there in our group right now. So he's been helping a lot of people with uh, coronavirus at this point of time in the uh, Kotakal Ayurveda Sala. So they are using Charaka Samhita principles you know, to help everybody as best as they can. Thank you, Lakshmi Bhagini for bringing this up. Can we have Kavita Bhagini? Namaste Praveena Guru. Uh, I, I'm asking this question on behalf of Kala Bhagini. Um, why is Shradham performed for the departed? Okay. Okay, so um, why should we perform the final rites? Because um, the person dies, they are not here with us anymore. 
So should we actually perform the rites? A lot of people ask this question, you know, uh, because the person itself is not there. I can rather donate that money to somebody else. Uh, why should I perform these, uh, the rites after the person uh, leaves? And it's done year on year, right? Because we believe that a person um, takes rebirth, goes somewhere else, so or even attains moksha depending on uh, his life. So why should I perform these periodic shraddhams is the question, I think. So um, it is uh, a really, uh, you know, mind, heart and emotion centric answer that I would uh, like to compile for this particular thing. Now, the thing is, uh, the person dies, yes. But we always say that our thoughts are still with them, right? There is this grantha which is called as Narayan Upanishad, which explains, which is a part of Atharva Veda, which explains a uh, uh, organization structure of how the uh, thing happens for this particular scheme of things, you know, the Shraddham, Tarpan and everything. What is the organization structure there? So it says that Lord Brahma created the Devaganas. Devaganas basically mean that they are the guardians of divinity. It is like the Indra, Vasu, Rudra, Aditya, etc. Now, after that, Brahma also created the 10 Vishwadi Devas, which means the protector of earth. And he also created the Saptarishis. We know about the Saptarishis, right? So the Saptarishis are said to have created what we call as the Pitragana. So these are just some of the things which are explained. For you to understand, I will simplify the whole thing. So this Vishwegana, the protector of earth, and this Pitragana, they together form the group, which is called as Loka Pitro, or our ancestors. So most of what we perform is addressing the ancestors through the departed person. So it is for everybody in that particular lineage where we offer all these things. Okay. So when we offer all this Tarpana, everything, what happens is the Loka Pitras are supposed to have the powers of Vayu or the air where they can move around freely, you know, even this coronavirus seems to spread through air, right? So the Lokapitras on a positive note can spread through air is what our Granta say. We have to do a lot of research to understand what this actually means, how do they tra travel in air, etc. So what is mentioned is that the offering or the oblations that we offer um, is received by these Vishwai Devas. And it is sent to our ancestors irrespective of where they exist. Now, to make this entire thing very, very simple, let me just uh, uh, tell it in a way that we uh, relate to it today. All of us know about the Dabbawalas in Bombay, right? The tiffin box is given to one person. Now, what do these Dabbawala do? They don't know who has to receive it. They just have the details. The person who collects it is not the person who is actually meant to receive that food, okay? Now, what do these Dabbawalas do? It goes through so many different hands and finally it reaches the person in a different location at the right time, in the right place, even without knowing their face or identity. And it is, you know, one of the uh, surprising things which say that 99.9% .9 accuracy rate is uh, followed even today in the Dabbawala concept. It is, you know, amidst all the uh, management people who are like, how can they be so perfect in this? So our Vishwe Devas uh, are something like this, you know, the person might, ha might have died, he might have gone even into some other body, he might be residing somewhere at this point of time. But they know to deliver this to the right person irrespective of where they are. That is the uh, belief system. And from an emotional level, it is our gratitude to our ancestors because they might have departed, they might not know what we are doing, but we know them and we want our subsequent generations to know them. So it is always a performance which is done to the current person who died and also to the previous generations. So we remember all of them on that particular day, time, etc., etc., which is their city where we say that let good things happen to them. And people also relate this to the Atma because the Atma never dies. Wherever they are, we want them to be good, happy, nice, right? So whatever we offer here, we offer it thinking that irrespective of where they are, let it be good. It's something like our uh, child is uh, studying in some other country. 
but on their birth they will still make uh, sweets here thinking of them so it is about the beautiful link between us and them which uh, possibly people at home will know oh yeah yeah today is the birthday my mom used to make these right we relate a lot of things depending on what our elders did so this is something like that where we carry it on to the subsequent generation so it is the atma which never dies so whatever we offer is to that person irrespective of where they are so that is an answer to this the next beautiful beautifully said uh, pravina guru raj could we could you unmute yourself raj raj ayer yes okay yeah before uh, pravina before i ask my question let me i want to make two comments interesting it is and one is to sujatha she has the first question and you talked about you know going to the temple and all that right in the 16th 17th century again i i've read this the mogal empires created a cess i.e. a tax for hindus going to temple to pray so to avoid the cess the hindus decided to bring the temple home and that brought out the concept of puja room otherwise there was no concept of puja room in the past second comment i want to make before i go to my question this is the last comment is in mexico and other spanish countries they celebrate a day in november i'm not sure i think it's a second it's called dia de los muertos dia means day day means of los muertos means of the dead so they celebrate the day for the dead where all the spirits of their ancient ancestors come home and many of them talk to them how true it is how false it is i don't know but it's a major celebratory occasion for them to connect to their roots again this is nothing to do with sanskrit but the fact that they do in another corner of the world something similar to what we do shraddha is interesting i thought okay now let me come to my question the first question i have is which shastra deals with interstellar space spaceship design i know you shared briefly a, a chart of a spaceship design i'm i'm getting very curious because i'm i'm you know i'm an engineer from iit so i'm very curious about technical designs is there something in shastra that tells us that's the first question and second question is i'm taking jyotiram class also and there surprisingly rahu and ketu are considered a planet okay uh, i think his connection yeah yeah no problem i understood the question so let me start my answers to this so um thanks raj for uh, bringing up the concept of you know one day shraddha for everybody in fact you will be surprised that our shastras not only restricts our offerings to just our ancestors you know if somebody has been a very good friend a person who has been very helpful a person who has made a difference to you or to anybody else and you want something good to be done to them gaya is a place where you can offer shraddha to anybody irrespective of relationship caste creed anything so suppose a person was working uh, for us at our home and uh, he was not our family um so i want to offer something to them gaya is a place where it's accepted so that is a beautiful thing that according to ashastra we can do it for anybody who has made a difference to us many people may not be aware that such a option is available because we think that everything is only the family way it's not like that we can do it to anybody who you think you know um, has to be protected saved and you wish well for them all right having said that going to your questions the two questions that you asked um about the space travel uh, mentioned in our scriptures the vedas explain this but it is in a seed form vedas are the universal knowledge so around 20 passages in rigveda it has uh, more than 1000 uh, passages 1028 ayans uh, are about the ashwini kumaras flying and it said that he helped a king called uh, bujju who was in distress at the sea and all that so typically we can assume that they had traveled from the skies to the sea so that is a reference in uh, rigveda ayurveda also mentions about uh, the ashwini kumaras using the flying machines but if you are looking for uh, specific uh, technical information which are required about uh, the vimana shastra there is this grantha which is called as 
Bharadwaja Vaimanika Shastra, which explains in detail all uh, what you have to know about the uh, flying machines in our scriptures. Uh, of course, Ramayana and Mahabharata explains many uh, uh, implementations of all these things. In fact, Mahabharata mentions about um, uh, 41 places uh, where the flying machines are used. And uh, there is a very interesting episode where um, there is an air attack of uh, Salva on Krishna's capital, which is Dwaraka. And um, he's supposed to have um, acquired a Vimana, which is um, uh, from the Talatala Loka, a different planetary region, and used it on Krishna. So all these explanations are there. So you could go and refer to the Bharadwaja Vaimanika Shastra. Now coming to the second question on your Jyotisham, why are Rahu and Ketu considered planets? Uh, uh, in your Jyotisham class, they explain this as planets. Now, the confusion usually happens because um, we translate uh, grahas and planets uh, to be one and the same, right? So just because Navagrahas are nine and planets are nine, it does not mean that grahas and planets are one and the same thing. The definition itself is different. Planet is typically defined as an astronomical body in the solar system that moves or orbits around the sun. Okay, But when we come to Graha, uh, I think I explained during our astronomy session as well, Grihyateiti Graha. So whatever forces attract uh, the earth, because we are on earth, everything is, you know, from our perspective. So earth attracts uh, or is attracted to certain things which uh, we call as the planets. So planets have always been nine in number for us and they have to be moving. That's when it becomes a planet. So that is another important thing. So now going to your specific question, why are Rahu and Ketu called as planets? Now, um, we don't even see them with our eyes, right? Um, so they don't exist at all, actually speaking. But if you observe, they would not have called it as planets. They would have called it as Chaya Graham. Chaya Graham means that they are not real ones. They are just shadows. But still, they are included as Grahas because our definition is whatever makes a difference to us, right? So what happens is the Rahu and Ketu are actually the points of intersection of the paths of the sun and the moon as they travel in the cel celestial sphere. So Rahu is the north lunar node and ketu is the south lunar node so um, it is a well-known fact that when um, the sun and moon um, are the lunar nodes the eclipses occur so because the eclipse is very important for us from the earth perspective these are actually called as chaya graham because it has an impact on us because of its gravitational force so instead of calling it as grahas, they have called it chaya grahas to make this a uh, difference. Thank you. Can we have Nina Bhagini? Please unmute yourself. Supravatam. Uh... Ravina Guru, those have been like very, very interesting uh, questions and answers. Uh, mine would be about technology. We had Vimana Shastra. Then we had the Pushpaka Vimana and other Vimana. What happened to the technology? Invaders usually take the technology of the invader. How come an advanced stream like Vimana Shastra was not taken away? It would have improved military might of all, right? There must have been a certain reason. Please tell us, Guru. So the thing is, um, uh, the technology, was it taken or not as a question, right? So instead of uh, answering that question, I have a beautiful video which was uh, given in the History Channel. Okay, so I'm just going to play that very short video where uh, the question will be answered uh, by itself. So let me just uh, share that.
ancient Sanskrit texts dating back as far as 6000 BC describe in varying but vivid detail flying machines called Vimanas. Vimanas are aeroplanes and they are powered by some jet engines. This seems to be true because all the description of the flight behavior, elephants ran away in panic grass was thrown out because there was a lot of pressure from behind those vimanas so that we can say this is a description of the spaceship although mainstream historians believe the vimana texts are myths many of the documents contain passages that seem to describe modern machinery and technology the Vimanika Shastra goes into metals that are used in these craft. It talks about electricity and power sources. It talks about the pilots and the clothing they have to wear. It talks about the food that they eat. It talks even about the weapons that are kept on these airships. The flight manuals of the Vimanas are quite similar to the flight manuals you find in the modern passenger flight business or uh, when you go to the military jet engines, of course, they have also flight manuals because it's necessary for a pilot to get knowledge about his plane he wanted to fly with. We also learn that these Vimanas could be controlled mentally. And this is a technology that modern militaries are beginning to develop. Even today, with as advanced as we think we are, almost every manifestation of an actual extraterrestrial civilization today would look almost like magic to us, where it has to do with technological electromagnetic systems that interface with coherent thought and organized thought. And this gets into to people go, wow, now you're losing me here. But I tell people, I said, yeah, well, you got to push your boundaries a little bit if you're talking about a true interstellar civilization. The Vimanaka Shastra, or science of aeronautics, indicates Vimanas used a propulsion system based on a combination of gyroscopes, electricity, and mercury. According to early Sanskrit texts discovered in India, aircraft called Vimanas used a similar propulsion system thousands of years ago. Is it possible that German scientists viewed ancient texts like the Bhagavad Gita not as legendary myth, but as a source of historical and scientific fact? The Germans were the best Oriental scholars in the world, so they translated the, uh, the ancient text, uh, Sanskrit and later, into German. And the Germans studied these ancient Indian epics and were familiar with the ideas of Vimanas. And so by combining that with this vortex technology and allegedly this crash disk from 1936 in the Black Forest, they then came up with their designs for these flying saucers. The issue of how are these civilizations traveling faster than the speed of light is a fundamental question. It's a scientific application of things that have been studied for thousands of years and they're within the Vedas, the ancient Vedic teachings or other ancient teachings, and it is there. But if Vimanas existed, could this prove there was a worldwide transportation network thousands of years before Columbus? In the Bhagavad Purana, which is an ancient Sanskrit history, there is a description of a spacecraft that was piloted by a king named Shalva. It's described that it was made of metal. It was described that it sometimes appeared to be in two places at once. It was described as having a motion similar to that of a butterfly. And these descriptions are consistent with what 
people who observe UFOs today report. In other Sanskrit text, such as the Mahabharata, the Rig Veda, and the Ramayana, there can be found descriptions of Vimana measuring as wide as 100 feet and often equipped with the capabilities of modern aircraft. One Vimana produced a shaft of light, which when focused on a target, consumed it with its power. Thank you so much. So that video basically explains how the information got transferred from here to whatever it is today. So I just wanted to share that. That was a fascinating. Uh, Dhanivada, Pravinanda. Dhanivada, Haninanda. Let's move on to the next question. Yes. Nishantji, could you please uh, come on screen? Nishantji. He's not coming on screen now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Actually, I was not able to. Uh, I don't know what happened. So well, my question was a very simple one. Uh, I just heard about the Vimana Shastra uh, answer. It was very interesting to note. But the crux of the thing was, uh, we had such a great Vimana Shastra science. And it is only now that people are going and finding out about Vimana Shastra and all. The thing was, for a long period, until the Wright brothers or uh, the person in Bombay who flew a plane, this thing was hidden. Nobody explored that. The idea was why it was not explored when this kind of things could have been a great breakthrough. Anyway, uh, leaving that question. My question is simple this, that we have our itihasas. Itihasas means itihasa, that is kind of history kind of thing. However, our itihasas like Mahabharata and uh, Ramayana have so many exaggerations in the storytelling. There are plenty of things which may seem to us like exaggerations because it doesn't happen nowadays. So th that makes us feel that it is some kind of imaginary stories. There are a lot of uh, group of uh, stories which have been written by a very imaginative, very talented writer. So a lot of people say that too, that uh, Maha, Adi Kavyas, uh, Ramayana or Mahabharata, both are uh, basically stories, not historical happenings. However, there are certain incidents which the places, all those things are also there, which show that it might have been history. So if a particular area has been taken up and then a story woven around that area, that is also very possible. But because nowadays we have a lot of books like the Dan Brown books and all that. Everything is taken up, but the thing is fiction. However, 10, 15, 20 years later, or maybe 200, 300 years later, we can say that Dan Brown's history or whatever books were history. Because everything else, the architecture, everything is mentioned in such detail that it appears that it is not fiction. It may be real, uh, like your Da Vinci codes and all this. Similarly, uh, or Mahabharata and all has gone because Mahabharata, the name was JM or something, and then we uh, started calling it Mahabharatam. And there are plenty of stories, there are parvams and all. There were uh, things that are said about the origin of species, even how every species is selected. A lot of things we go into Mahabharata. So, how do we say that this really happened? It is a history, or it is a very great literary work. So how do we differentiate that? Thank you. Thank you, Nishanji. And he calls this as a very simple question. So uh, for your simple question, I will also give simple answer. So I request all of you to just hold on for some time because this is going to be a very um, uh, important thing for us to uh, equip ourselves with. Because as Nishanji was asking, how do we know that these are facts? A lot of people ask this question. So I want to do justice to giving this answer. So I will take 10 to 15 minutes. Just hold on, be with me. And 
there are so many reasons why we call this as a fact why ramayana and mahabharata are facts we have to know all what uh, have gone behind it the researches that have been done so i will go into a uh, step by step detail of this so for everybody else you know i could talk or give an answer but because it is nishan ji's question and it's a simple question i had to come up with some slides okay so let me share some slides here and uh, explain some very uh, interesting part of the entire uh, research okay now um first of all um any book of fiction will try to make it very interesting you know for the reader to understand as far as our ramayana and mahabharata are concerned it goes into specific details that at some time we are like oh my god why should i read all these things you know for example the uh, mahabharata goes on to explaining the lineage the hierarchy of kings from king manu all the way to what is happening at that point of time so it elaborates around 50 kings so why would a book of fiction explain about 50 kings it would stop with four or five right so it is the actual thing which is explained it's like a documentary which might be boring but which gives all the facts while a movie may not give all the facts but it just makes it interesting right so we distinguish between a documentary and a movie that way similarly Uh, our uh, itihasa give the dynasty well in detail and that actually uh, you know makes it a little uh, theoretical or long but they don't compromise on that second thing is sanskritam is very very clear about the naming convention that it uses you know there are words called katha for story kavya for you know um, the epic kind of thing mahakavya is the actual epics that we see um Ramayana and Mahabharata are called as itihasas, which means this is exactly the way it happened. So the naming convention is very clear on you know telling that that these are facts and not fiction. So that is another thing that we have to understand. Now coming to archaeological evidences, um, there is a lot of marine archaeology which is gone you know uh, on the city of uh, Dwaraka. in gujarat which has uncovered some amazing uh, references and um, some real places uh, are also mentioned for example uh, mahabharata explains about uh, some 150 places okay throughout mahabharata there are around 150 places even today around 90 places we will be able to identify with its location and name so that is one very interesting thing so if you just have a look at it uh, hastinapur is still called as hastinapur so when you go to hastinapur and the distance it is mentioned you know 150 kilometers from delhi it is still there mathura krishna's capital is still there the indraprastham which is old delhi now it's still there so a lot of such uh, places as explained in the scripture we still find with the same name and it is not one or two it is around 90 places which still use the same name and um, uh, there are around um, 35 sites in north india especially which has given us archaeological evidences you know like uh, copper utensils iron seals uh, gold ornaments silver ornaments uh, some terracotta discs uh, pottery so all these have been scientifically dated and the datings will surprise us i'll just go to that in a minute so these kind of information are uh, you know very exciting to say the least and then going on to uh, some of the recent findings which is again a uh, mind blowing um i will just uh, share that here with you okay Now, if you just have a look at the uh, thing, one minute. I'll just reshare it. I think I had some issue with it.
Okay. Can you see the screen now? No, no. I, we can I see, see your desktop. desktop. We can't, we can't see, see the screen. screen. Now? No, Pravina Guru. No. Now? No. No. Only a desktop, desktop we can see. I don't know why this is happening. Okay. If you're able to see, just let me know. Yes. Are you able to see? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. All right, so just to continue with some of the um, actual archeological information that we can see. Uh, when uh, Hanumanji visits Lanka, uh, Valmiki Maharishi has mentioned that he saw elephants which have four tusks, okay? So we would not even know that there are elephants with four tusks, right? Um, but now uh, they have found out that uh, there are uh, elephants which existed like millions of years back, which had four tusks. So those, uh, you know, uh, information are now surprising people because there existed such elephants, which is mentioned in the Ramayana. In fact, it is mentioned twice, once again, um, uh, Tara, I mean, uh, when Sita is in the, um, um, as a captive, one of the uh, Rakshasis there, Trijada, Vibhishana's daughter, also mentions about the Fortas elephant, which uh, protect Lanka. So that is something that they knew at that time, which we were not aware. And we know that NASA came out with uh, the satellite image where um, uh, the bridge Ramasetu was visible. Uh, and they have concluded that it is a man-made bridge. So that is again, you know, a bridge which is mentioned in Valmiki Ramayana where all the uh, monkeys, even the squirrel help Rama connect the um, uh, sea between um, the uh, uh, India and Sri Lanka at that point of time. So that is something which has come up in um, NASA's uh, image. Now, this is a very interesting um, oceanography evidence where in the coast of Gujarat, you know, the Gulf of Kambat and the city of Dwaraka has been found out from excavation. Uh, in uh, Mahabharata, it explains very clearly that um, once uh, Krishna's uh, time was completed, Krishna announced and informed Arjuna that uh, the country will now go into water. So he has to protect whoever needs to be protected. And then the country went into, the city went into water. Now, all those things are still there underwater is what archeology span uh, says. And they've also dated the Gulf of Kambat as uh, 7,500 BC. So these are, uh, you know, have a closer look at it. So the submerged fort walls of Dwaraka, um, the circular stone structure, etc etc all these are the underwater images seen in the dwaraka oceanography excavation now what did they find from all these things they found that the walls pillars triangular rectangular stone structures a single hole stones l-shaped forts were there seals inscriptions which backdate 2500 bc was found pottery was found stone sculptures terracotta beads bronze copper iron objects were found so all these, and um, the person uh, who was uh, heading all this, Mr. Rao says, only the name board was missing, everything else was found. So, so much of information could be got from the Dwaraka excavation. Now, it does not end there, okay? So the new findings take archeologists co uh, closer to Krishna. This was a news item um, in uh, Times of India, which speaks about two coins which was found in Afghanistan. And what was there in the coin will surprise us. It was Krishna and Balarama. And it was uh, from the Greeks, okay? And um, 
all of us know the Sudarshana Chakra is uh, uh, had by Lord uh, Krishna. So, so uh, Krishna is seen with the Sudarshana Chakra in the coin and Balarama with his uh, axe. So these were, you know, something which uh, people were very surprised. And these coins are dated at least 180 BC, which would be like around 2,500 years old at least. And the second part of this speaks about the uh, pillar. So this samba was constructed by the Greek people because they worshipped Lord Krishna. So that is what is mentioned in the uh, uh, Garuda Stambam itself. So usually when we go to any of uh, the Vishnu temples, we will have a Stambam which we worship first. So this was such a Stambam which was constructed by Heliodorus. And he says that, Ho Vasudeva, I am your devotee, I worship you. So that inscription is now being found and this is also dated at least 150 years before um, Christ. So here, um, the uh, Samba's explanations are mentioned here. This is the close-up look of the Samba. And um, the researchers say that close to 10,000 Greeks who came in the wake of Alexandra, uh, Alexander the Great were Krishna's devotees. So these are now from the archaeological survey of India. So these can't be said that, you know, these don't exist. The most exciting thing that I could uh, gather in this entire thing is the fossil folklore, uh, which was uh, one of the reasons why Alexandra van der Geer went to a place called Saligramam, which is in Nepal uh, in today's context, but which used to be part of the uh, bigger uh, Bharata because um, that is where uh, a lot of uh, people who participated in the war came from. So when she went to do her research on the fossils uh, as a folklore, she found out amazing um, excavations, which gave her a different perspective of Mahabharata. So she says that the fossils which are found in these locations, one, two, which is outside of today's India, and these central locations, as well as some parts of Nepal, 14, 15, and 16, all these have the remains of the uh, Mahabharata war. So she has mentioned all the spaces in her research document, and it's a complete document. If anybody is interested, let me know. I have a copy of it. I can share it. So she says that all these places have these specific information on, uh, you know, the fossils which can be collected, which will give you a lot of evidence about the Mahabharata war. So just to read a few statements of hers, she says that the uh, Mahabharata epic during which hundreds of mighty and some gigantic heroes, horses, war elephants are said to have died. She says all these are now there in the Shivalik hills. Rains have actually brought these out and the archaeological artifacts along with the um, remains have influenced, you know, the great battle of the Indian epic. So she says that these are actually true facts. So one such remain is this huge tusk of an elephant. So we don't see elephants coming out with such huge tusks now, but this was mentioned in the war also, where Bhishma was almost killed by an elephant having such a huge tusk and how, uh, you know, the Pandavas uh, saved his life. So that elephant's tusk was actually found here as one of the fossil remains. So, so much of such information and um, this is another very, very powerful thing which we can't say no to. The ASI experts, um, you know, in another excavation uh, found out coffins, three chariots, swords, beads, helmets, um, which were all dating back to 2000 to 1800 BC. So uh, Dr. Um, Manjul, who was in charge of this entire thing, has mentioned that this came as a complete surprise to all of them. And, uh, you know, it is, um, it can't be denied anymore. So that kind of information, because we thought the chariots were not existing earlier. Metals were not known to people earlier. Now, these kind of excavations prove those uh, things wrong. So, so much of information are available. So to complete this, I will say that it's not just the material, 
we also have videos spoken by those people it's a very very short videos so i will uh, show that to conclude the session village in the The Sinhali village in the North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh had been a site of interest for Indian archaeologists since the last decade when they found around 115. Video is not coming, uh, Praveena Guru. To confirm the existence of an ancient civilization in the region. Beyond Nagain Singh, brings you. Sorry, you're not able to hear it? No, video is not coming. It's your desktop. Oh. Now, can you see my screen? Yeah, but uh, there's nothing. There's just a gray patch. It's not playing. The Sinhali village in the North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh had been a site of interest for Indian archaeologists since the last decade. When Only the audio is there, Praveena Guru. Video is not there. Site and more... Still not visible? No. Only audio is coming. No video. Okay. Okay, now I think you should be able to hear. You can see the screen? Yeah. yeah. The Sinhali village in the North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh had been a site of interest for Indian archaeologists since the last decade when they found around 116 ancient burial sites and mortal remains. It confirmed the existence of an ancient civilization in the region. Vyond's Nagain Singh brings you this report. <laughs> In the small village of Sinholi in Uttar Pradesh, the Archaeological Survey of India has found 4,000-year-old chariots for the first time in the history of the Indian subcontinent. These chariots have been found near a burial which contains a coffin placed between the chariots. The findings are extremely significant to understand the new cultural horizon of the region and its relationship with the Indus Valley civilization. However, unlike the Indus Valley civilization, archaeologists have discovered chariots engraved with copper, which also symbolize royalty and technical perfections of the era. These evidences clearly shows the advancement and sophistication of the culture. The art and craft certainly so improved. So improved. They have casting technique, they have beating technique, they have uh, even in the wood craft is so uh, meticulous and so beautifully made coffin. The excavation work commenced at the site in April this year under the Archaeological Survey of India. Extensive exploration work was also conducted along with the excavation work at Barnava for the better understanding of the settlement pattern in this region during the prehistoric period. Even the locals are delighted that their village will register its name in the history book soon. There have been several excavations in the area. However, this site has reported outstanding discoveries and the remains of chariots along with burial goods. We got eight burials in this trench. Uh, uh, within that, three burials is really very, very important uh, to note that 
that three burials is a coffin burial. So that's an exciting part to uh, for us to understand the process of coffin and burial process, and also the uh, construction process, art and craft, etc., etc. These discoveries prove that 4,000 years ago, warriors had chariots. What is exciting with this new finding is that this civilization may have its own identity. A few years ago, 116 burials were excavated from the same village. Will this compel us to add another chapter to our history books? This is the answer the historians are trying to find out with this investigation. With video journalist Ajit, Nagen Singh, Beyond. So that is such a amazing discovery that has happened. So um, we have one last question, Pravina Guru. Oh, if okay. Finished. Uh, uh, just one minute. I'll conclude this. I'll just conclude this. Give me a second. Okay, so we were explaining about, um, uh, you know, the recent uh, findings from the archaeology, right? And I also mentioned about uh, the uh, Dwaraka uh, concept. So that also had a very interesting um, one minute. I'm just trying to open that file. So again, I think you will not be able to see my file. Are you able to see my screen? Uh, no, uh, no, it's, it's just a great patch. Okay, ask your question by then. I'll try to open this. Is Narayan Mohanji there? I can't see him because I don't okay. know if he's. Uh, there. I think we will cancel that question. It's okay, Sujataji. We can use that in the next session. Okay, I'm not able to share that. It's okay. So I think we've had a lot of information today. So my system says that's enough. All right. So um, similarly, I also had the Dwaraka excavation. Possibly uh, when we meet next time, I could share that information also. So there are a lot of oceanographic evidences. There are a lot of uh, you know archaeological excavations which have proved that these are true. But in spite of all this, if people you know, don't want to accept realities, then, you know, uh, there's nothing much that uh, we can do to wake up people who assume that they are sleeping rather than actually sleeping. So this is uh, so much that we have and informations are coming, you know, every day something new happens, a lot of uh, new things evolve and uh, we can keep updating our deck. So um, any discussion based on anything that we discussed today, anybody can unmute now and ask questions. Venuji was ready with Narayan Mohanji's question. In case if there are no more questions, she can. I think we've already exceeded our time, so we will. Uh... Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. Thank you. Any any uh, general question? Anybody can unmute and uh, share your views. Hello, namaste. Hello, namaste. Hello, namaste. namaste. Uh, somebody was asking about the, uh, the Navagrahas and then uh, how it is. Uh, it is so interesting to know as a, as a person with some physics background and cosmology background. 
how they connected the uh, the power of gravitation of the the entire thing is our solar system is having sun as the center and earth as the uh, we are all in the earth and there are nine planets originally out of that uh, the outer planets that is uranus neptune and pluto they are so far that they cannot have any gravitational impact on us on the earth mm. now our horoscopes or our jyotish is such an interesting thing to note that the frame of reference was taken earth as the zero and the remaining planets have been taken how they influence the person individual at on earth correct so this is called the shifting of frame of reference yeah so if you take this they have beautifully connected the seven planets or the the planets which are having most influence on us from the gravitational point of view is the six planets and also the uh, satellite of earth that is uh, moon which is having such a close relationship so is equal to, that is the force is equal to k into d1 d2 by m square that is so m1 m2 by d square so this is the force yeah. so if you take whereas the m is the mass of the planet m2 is the earth's planet earth as a planet and d is the distance between earth and the body heavenly body this is very normal okay the most interesting thing our ancestors did was that is they included the spin concept mm. that is if you take earth as the center then the its orbital as you have mentioned that the two nodal points the earth gets one positive spin and negative spin this comes in the quantum mechanics who have studied quantum mechanics will know that spin effect so they judge the positive and negative spin of earth as the nodal points and they decided as ragu and ketu right. it is such a advanced uh, calculation that uh, I, always i am wondering over the people how they had this type of vision in calculation that is how it is so for the sake of time i just stop it here uh, thank you so uh, much pravina guru it was a very interesting thank you um, session i had with you though i have heard many times so it was very nice the way in which you have explained all thank you thank you so much thank you so much meena ji you have something anubagini meena ji anything you all want to add to just conclude it no it is just that you know at the bit we're only touching the tip of the iceberg guru uh, whenever you talk about these things you know and this actually makes us more and more proud of our heritage and we really want to pass it on to the next generation so thank you for initiating the series truly grateful thank you so much so uh, the whole idea is let's get all the answers that we need so that we can pass it on to the next generation because when people ask us questions we are like we didn't ask these questions to our elders so how do we pass it on to the next generation right so let's equip ourselves with the right answers so that we can transfer it to the next generation thank you so much so the next um, vidyanidhi is going to be our concluding vidyanidhi the samaropa karyakrama so all of you please participate and make our journey a grand success dhanyavaad thank you dhanyavaad pravina guru thank you so much